There's been so much interest in this Pluto in Aquarius theme. So much chatter, so much conversation, so much curiosity, even in the mainstream of people. What is it actually about that that in and of itself has become part of the narrative that we should probably explore? Just the broad interest shows how loud the mainstreaming of an esoteric idea is when it enters the culture. That's a moment of cultural change, a transitional moment. And we are witnessing that broadly. The, the, the transition itself is calling attention to itself, right? There's this doctrine, if you will, or sort of a, an axiom or principle in astrology that the the moment of transition, the moment that a the ingress that a cycle starts, whether that cycle be two planets coming together, such as a Kazemi to the sun and the beginning of a synodic cycle, or some other type of conjunction, or the restart of a long sequence such as an orbit or what have you whatever cycle it is you are using as a lens or filter through which to look at the correlations of reality in these archetypal symbol sets that adds a layer that lets you look at the information in a different way and so one of the ways we look at it is if it's a cycle that matters you'll get a sudden burst of information about that cycle at its beginning. So if it's a 20-year cycle, a 200-year cycle, or a two-year cycle, or even a one-year cycle, at the beginning point, there's a kind of oomph of energy, like my other video, I called it the ploop, right? The a uh, plop of a rock going through the surface of a pond and the ripples that are thrust outwards, forwards and backwards in time from that ingress, that transition point. So using those metaphors, when a planet first enters a sign, even if that planet is going to be there for 40 years, we would expect to get a lot of information at that point. And that seems to be what's happening. When Pluto first entered into Aquarius in the Western whole house system, uh, we got a sudden burst of information about AI. And then when it rolled back into Capricorn, that kind of quieted down and we had some disruption in that space, the Sam Altman firing and rehiring uh, at OpenAI and all of that stuff Ooh, in the Capricorn phase. And now it's come back into Aquarius and there's a reburst of new releases, new companies, new products, and this explosion of conversation again around the transformative nature of AI. The timing is really interesting. But on to other ways of looking at this transition point. One of the the things that makes this time, I think, so loud in all of the change happening all at once and so much conversation around it across social media platforms that I'm aware of is to be expected because we have this ploop moment, this ingress moment, this seasonal start, this launch, this ribbon cutting ceremony, right? We make a lot of fanfare at beginnings, right? That's kind of what this is, energetically. But it's the beginning of multiple things. You know, a, a 200-year cycle that kind of kick-started in 2020. Uh, you know, 80-year cycles, 40-year cycles. Now this new 20-year Plutonian cycle. Um, they're all happening or changing within a quick period of time. Like in the next year or so, year and a half, 18 months, we have like all the major outer planets switching signs in succession. Pluto being the first big one, and then we're gonna you know, see 
uh, Saturn and Uranus and Jupiter and, and Neptune and, you know, make all their noises here in the next few years to 2025, 2026. And I think all of those big momentous changes will be correlated to massive cultural change. So that how we run things, what we think is normal, what we think is odd, how the, the map looks, how money works, how people communicate with each other, what is and isn't tolerated will be different in a decade than now. Because there's another aspect to this that's extremely Plutonian, and that is the demographic shift that we're in, at least the way I notice it and slice it. I've reached a point where my beard is gray. I am as Santa Claus as I have ever been in my life. I'm 59 going into 60 in my decade of the 60s, and that's a new shift for me, right? The 60s, literally becoming grandpa energy, Santa Claus energy versus dad energy, right? It's a shift from dad to elder, and it's weird. But part of what is happening culturally is that we have a social domination by the old over the young, which is really interesting because modern culture also worships youth, doesn't want to talk about old age and dementia or mental health, doesn't want to talk about, you know, it's always youth and energy that's been celebrated for this entire period of our cultural history. But the reality is, is that we are actually dominated by a class which is old in many ways, not just age, but archetypally. Old empires, old money, old banking, old families of influence are losing their grip of control and new upstarts, youthful Asian tigers and various others of the global south, of the global youth, are rising in ascendancy. And there's a shift in power dynamic, broadly from old to new. It's a very Pluto old, established, deep, shadowy, unseen, the foundations underneath, like the pillars that go into the earth, right? The stuff that you can't, you think, well, how can we even change the building? Because the foundation is so entrenched. Plutonic change digs up the foundations and overturns them. That's why it's so epochal. It has to go down to the basement, right? And one of the things I see is that we've sort of created this world where the old are stealing the future from the young. And this is manifest in the fact that young people, my children's age, adults getting married and starting their families and wanting homes and gardens and lives, absolutely cannot obtain those things and see no path forward, even in the most privileged state, in the most privileged country in the world, see no path forward towards that future. It is simply not available to them and will never be in the current situation. How long do you think that will last? That cannot stand. The, the entire generation of young people cannot be just in a wave of the hand disenfranchised by those who have come before. It cannot stand, especially since those who have come before are dying, are weakening, and those who are coming up are becoming more numerous and more powerful by the year. We are at that transition, the whole different generation taking over and saying, no, you have overvalued everything and you have strip mined opportunity and resources from us, and I'm sorry, uh, we are now going to be taking care of you in your dotage, and we're changing things. So that's part of where we're at, and that's part of the plutonic shift archetypally. Old, entrenched, young, new, reversal. Especially when you get the Uranian square influence, right? And now all of these 
Inner planets are going to begin making their conjunctions. Mercury, Mars, ugh, Venus. Boom, boom, boom. Here in the next season. In other words, more gongs, more ploops, more rocks in the pond. Awaking and reviving and reminding of this Pluto archetype, which is going to keep ringing in various layers. So just the other day, I had a conversation that really woke me up, and I'd like to just put this out there. It's a little dark, in keeping with the subject of Pluto and all its symbolism. So a warning for that it goes some... Anyway, I'll, I'll try and keep it uh, scientifically uh, expressed so you get the point and not distracted by the subject matter. Because part of what I'd like to share in my just rambling understanding of, of what some of these symbols mean is that we need to become more comfortable with the fact that these symbols are complex. It's, it's a nuanced, complicated symbol set because it's describing culture, which is a big, massive, nuanced, complex thing, right? What even is culture? I mean, culture in a way is like a set of memes, self-reinforcing and self-propagating memes that attempt to control and structure behavior in a broad way. And that changes constantly as the next generation rises up and says, no, we want to wear baggy pants <laughs> and listen to loud music, right? And you can't tell us no. Each time the memes change, but then we get born into these cultures that we didn't really have a say in and we're supposed to fit into whatever the norms of the time are. You know, so as Terence McKenna famously said, culture is not your friend. It exists to help itself. <laughs> Corporations are not your friend, right? Governments are not your friend. Nothing that is inherently self-preservational is your friend, right? So I'm just throwing that out there. On to a story. I'm just going to share a story, and then uh, hopefully you'll see how immensely plutonic and Pluto in Aquarius this is, this story is, for our moment. So one of our family friends is a very interesting human, is a, I guess the best way to say it, is an exotic dancer who works in a club where people, usually men in this case, come and pay money to see um, beautiful people dance and maybe sit down and have a conversation with them at a table, right? It is a world which our current prevailing culture has defined as the underworld, right? It has been assigned a plutonic place in our culture, which has more or less been controlled by a, a kind of uh, a Christianized... Uh, the Protestant work ethic kind of thing, European Christian culture is more or less dominant. That area of human interaction and commerce and complexity and nuance is considered, we don't really want to look at it. That's the shadow side of culture, first of all. So that's interesting, platonic. So she works one of her side jobs in order to make a living as a young person in this world who cannot actually follow a different path because there are no more opportunities left, right? So she's following this interesting, shadowy, strange human path. But she's making observations. And her and several of her colleagues are saying they are looking at, they're actually doing a demographic study of their clientele. They're making notes and they're saying, wow, okay, so I had a person of this gender, this self-expression, this age, this level of affluence wanting these things and talking about these things, right? And they're actually doing a scientific study of their clientele. It's amazing. As a side note, you will notice, I have noticed. So I've been in and out of the world of entertainment, theater and media and journalism and all of that stuff for my whole life, basically. And so I have known people at various levels 
of theatrical expression and performance in my life. So I've known a number of people it, uh, who work in what is socially considered the exotic side of these, of these trades. And can I just say as an aside that broadly speaking, all of these people are smart. Like there is, I think, a bias that anybody who takes their clothes off is dumb. And I think I, in my experience, it's the exact opposite. They're all kind of freakishly brilliant. And so anyway, that aside, they're making a scientific study of this group of clients. And this friend just made a, just, a, just it just startled me so much. What, what they were describing, they said, there is a striking majority they were saying probably in the 60 to 70% of their clientele are from the world of high tech and even more specifically, AI engineers, engineers, very smart engineers working in the world of high tech. And that of that very obvious more than 50%, so majority clientele, Quite a few of them are what might be categorized as the classic incel, like, like these are probably neurodivergent, genius programmer type individuals somewhere on the spectrum who have difficulty with human in interaction at, and therefore struggle with relationships. They're very good at their brainy engineering jobs. They make a lot of money at it. And so then they go to clubs or private places where they pay money to have strangers interact with them in a way that they are uncomfortable having in their real lives, quote unquote. They're able to put it into this frame where they feel safe enough to have an intimate human experience that is the best they can manage because of all the other factors in their life. So first of all, that's profoundly eye-opening and awakening. I, I feel immense sympathy and open-heartedness towards this category of person who is broken but doing well within our culture, but well, what does well mean? How is it defined? That they have to, that there is a culturally imposed sense of shame around that type of behavior, and yet we venerate what they build for us but then we mock and condemn who they are living within the contradictions of, of all those pressures. So that's wow. And I, I don't know enough to go into commentary about that world. I'm just saying it is highly Pluto in Aquarius. Also because there's an aspect of strangeness and foreignness and disassociation and challenge connection, but yet a yearning for connection and sociality, even if it's through a medium of exchange that's... Ah. Again, I can't really comment on all this stuff. I, I'm, I'm not educated enough in the underlying implications to go there, except to say, this is Pluto in Aquarius. It is strange, it is odd, it is, it forces us to confront things that may even be taboo or uncomfortable. And we are confronting all those things in the social dialogue. We are having loud conversations about really confronting challenging subjects. Pluto in Aquarius, the, the shadow side of Pluto in Aquarius. But I'm going to take, this story took it one step further, even than that. So you see the layers and layers and layers of Pluto in Aquarius, strangeness and depth as we examine these symbols. So then they described among this population of AI developers who go to uh, strip clubs, a strong percentage of them when asked if they are afraid of what they are doing, of AI, the building out of this thing, they say, yes, absolutely, they are. And then when asked the follow-up question, then why, why are, are you doing this? They all say something along the lines of basically, this is what we're doing now. This is what happens at this point in the timeline. This, this it just, somebody else is going to do it. So we're doing it and we'll see. A kind of fatalism. 
And when I heard that story, I was startled because it then immediately made me think of Oppenheimer and this incredibly interesting Barbenheimer phenomenon we had last summer in cinema and popular culture, which is all Pluto and, of course, both sides of them. I'll go into Barbie later, but just, just the Oppenheimer side. There was this thread of these, these smart guys, these physicists going, we might ignite the atmosphere. Uh, we actually might, but we're doing it. We're going forward. It, some, it, the Russians are going to do it. The Germans are going to do it. We, we got to do it first. Like this fatalism in even potentially existential tech is an interesting, disturbing trend that I think is extremely Pluto in Aquarius. There is this almost separation between high-tech advancement and is it good for the people or not question. It is Aquarian in and of itself. So I just wanted to put out there some more musings and meditations on these because I do want to challenge the kind of 1960s age of Aquarius glowing Oh, power to the people narrative, which is a beautiful narrative, but it is not the only thing going on. That there's a lot of, whoa, weird, shadowy, this is complex. We have to have serious discussions about these kind of things, subjects embedded in symbolism that might throw people for a loop. This is not just an all golden time, as we can tell. And all of the things that are going on are predicted in the symbol set of the astrology that's going on. So I just simply continue to find layers of uh, thought experiments and rabbit holes to go down about this Pluto and Aquarius. So I'm putting it out there since I've had a lot of questions and interest on this subject. So anyway, let me know what you think in the comments. It's a, a lot of people are chatting and talking, especially on YouTube for the astrology community. So I'm throwing in my two cents, broadly speaking. All right, ciao, my friends. Have a good one. Two, two, two.